All right, I'm going to go ahead and get started. Just uh, we have a full webinar today, so I want to make sure that we have lots of time to hear from the panelists. So hello, everyone. Uh, welcome back to the National Trust webinar series. My name is Priya Chaya. I am the Associate Director of Content here at the National Trust for Historic Preservation. And we're so excited to see everyone uh, virtually today. Um, we are excited to present this webinar, which is going to feature the leadership of the National Trust family of organizations as we begin commemorating our 75th anniversary later this month. Um, I also wanted to take a moment to recognize you because so much of our work is possible because of you, our supporters, and that's we're so grateful that we have so many people from all over the country joining us today for what promises to be an exciting conversation. As always, though, we want to start with a few technical uh, things and logistics. Um, we will take questions from the audience during the webinar. Uh, please send questions via the Q&A function at the bottom of your screen. You're welcome to submit them at any point during the conversation, but we'll be waiting until the Q&A section to answer those that you send in. You're also encouraged to communicate to all participants during using the chat function. I will note here that we've had a few pre-submitted questions that we'll try and go through first before we tackle the stuff submitted in the chat, um, in the Q&A function. Uh, the closed captioning function is also enabled for this webinar. You can enable it and disable it either through the controls at the bottom of your Zoom screen or through your audio settings. It depends largely on what version of Zoom you're using. Following this program, and we know people will be asking this question, um, we will be sending out a recording of today's webinar directly to the email you use to register. And finally, all webinars are available on our YouTube channel. So if for some reason you don't see that email come in, just check our YouTube channel in about 24 hours and it'll be on that. Um, as a reminder, we ask that everyone is respectful to each other in the chat and follow our code of conduct. Uh, Colleen, uh, my colleague, has just posted it in the chat, um, but you can also find it on our website at savingplaces.org if you Google, uh, use the search function to find code of conduct. Um, so as I mentioned, we have a full conversation today. So I want to quickly introduce our panelists. Rhonda, you can switch the slide. Um, so today, please join me in welcoming the National Trust President and CEO, Carol Quillen, Main Street America President and CEO, Aaron Barnes, National Trust Community Investment Corporation President and CEO, David Clower, and NT Green Fund President, Patrice Fry. Uh, they're going to give us a little bit more information about who they are instead of me telling you we're going to hear directly from them. So uh, Carol, David, Patrice, and Aaron, if you can join us on screen. Hi. Good morning. Good morning. Good morning. <laughs> um, so I think, Carol, why don't you start? Sure. Well, thanks so much, Priya. And thank you all so much for joining us. It's great to, to be with you uh, in this Zoom format um, that we're all getting used to. And um, I'm, I'm coming to you from Washington, D.C., in uh, my apartment here, which was clearly designed for Zoom. It looks best on Zoom. So I try to do most of my Zooms um, from this location, which um, I think should I should sell as a Zoom background. Uh, I wanted to start just by telling you a little bit about me. As most of you know, I didn't come to this incredible opportunity through the field of preservation. My background is in higher education. I was trained as a historian. So probably a couple of um, factors led me to be a credible candidate for this job, which I feel so fortunate to hold. Um, I grew up in Newcastle, Delaware, which is an old town. And one of the first things I remember noticing as a kid is that Newcastle didn't look like every place else. The sidewalks were brick, the streets were cobblestone, the houses looked different from houses that I saw in other neighborhoods in all different kinds of ways. And that particularity, the particularity of the built environment, I think inspired in me a kind of connection to people who had gone before, the people who had built those buildings and imagined that town that I lived in, in some cases, hundreds of years later. Uh, and, and I think that sense of connection is what triggered my interest in history, which I studied in college and graduate school. So as a historian, I was mostly interested in the ways in which people living in one time understand, translate, make use of, interpret cultural artifacts that were created in a distant and different time. And there's a 
preservation dimension to that work, um, in part because preservation is partly about activation, right? It's partly about understanding the relevance and the meaning of things from the past in our present. And that was a question that interested me also as a historian. So I think growing up in Newcastle and then my background as a historian led me to be really interested in this position. And then I just believe that preservation tools and approaches are really crucial given the challenges and opportunities that we face right now in our country. So hopefully, I think the jury's still out, but hopefully some of the skills I learned in my career as higher ed will be useful and helpful as I try to do this job. Um, and I'm just committed to trying every day to live up to the confidence that the board um, showed in me by giving me this opportunity. So I think I'll stop there. I know we have a lot of questions and, um, turn it over to, I think, is Aaron next? Thanks to my Aaron. colleague, Aaron. Yeah. Thanks, it's great to be here with everybody. Um, I appreciate you taking the time out of your day to to talk with us. Um, I, I can share a little bit about my background and and why I'm here today. I think my, my work and my passion has always been at the intersection of people, power, and place. And I cut my teeth professionally as a community organizer in the hook and bullet community out West. Um, I went to the Yale School of Forestry where I studied environmental preservation and conservation and became interested in people led movements for clean air and clean water and endangered places and endangered species. Um, I founded an organization called IOBI that focused on neighbor led community projects um, and I, I came to Main Street because I saw an opportunity to apply what I had learned about growing movements um, for positive change. I feel really lucky to be here and to follow in the footsteps of so many great leaders in the Main Street movement before me, like Mary Means and Kennedy Smith and, of course, Patrice Fry, um, because Main Streeters are caregivers. Uh, they care for and they shape the places that they love they find the thing that's the most special about their communities, whether it's the culture or the history or the architecture or the way the sun sets just right through a crack between some buildings. And they put some spit and polish on it and they make it shine. And all of those places shape the people who live there. Um, one of my favorite quotes about this work uh, comes from the side of a building that I saw in a neighborhood in Cleveland one day that said, knowing your neighbor will transform love into power. And I see my role as facilitating that knowing between neighbors. And I believe a shared commitment to the places that we love is one of the best ways to do it. So I'll stop there and I look forward to the conversation. I'll pass it over to my colleague, David. Thank you, Aaron. Um, I'm also happy to be here and I'll, I'll share my story, which is that uh, I won't go all the way back to the beginning, but in the early 90s and through the great, up until the great financial crisis, uh, I spent my time professionally working in uh, commercial and investment banking, starting really in Silicon Valley and moving to Austin, Texas. I worked in New York City and in Houston, focusing mostly in commercial real estate development, finance nationwide, and underwriting commercial mortgage-backed securities. But in 2010, um, I joined a small community development financial institution based in Phoenix, Arizona, which was led by a gentleman um, named Thomas Minoza, who was a giant in community development, who inspired me and showed me that my gifts could be channeled in a way that could help me build a, a world-class team that could bring compassionate capital to low-income Latino communities across the country to elevate families and children and help them break the cycle of poverty. And he gave me purpose like I'd never felt before. And uh, we secured an investment grade rating together. We raised and deployed over a billion dollars of impact capital and became one of the most respected CDFIs in the, in the nation in, in, in the process. And about six years ago, I was invited to join National Trust Community Investment Corporation's board of directors. Uh, and I began to really learn about our business. I served on its um, on our investment committee. I chaired the audit finance risk committee, and I also served on the executive committee. And then when I decided I was ready for a new challenge, it was quite coincidental that um, NTCIC had just begun its search for its third permanent CEO. And so 
I started my new job in February of this year. So I am new, but really not so new. Um, but I was already in love with the work that we do, which is revitalizing communities through adaptive reuse of historic sites. And we do that through the use of tax credit investment strategies. But just as importantly, um, it's the people that I work with, our shared values and our organizational culture that differentiates this company. And, and these are the things that really excite me every day. Um, I'm going to pass it on to Patrice. Thank you, David. Well, Patrice Fry, I am the incoming president and CEO of the new NT Green Fund, which I'm excited to share more with all of you about over the course of the conversation. Um, I am probably the longest, I know I'm the longest tenured person on this phone call. Um, I've been with the National Trust actually for about 17 years and several different roles uh, leading the Trust Sustainability Program. Um, as Mayor Aaron has mentioned, as CEO of Main Street for uh, nearly 10 years, and most recently, um, of course, having the honor to lead the launch of this new subsidiary, the NT Green Fund, in partnership with Carol, David, and Aaron. Um, my, my personal story actually probably goes back to when I was uh, 17. I had the um, opportunity to be a congressional page in DC. And so I was there for a semester during high school and I had I'd grown up in suburban Seattle in a 1970s subdivision. And I have to tell you, the experience of being in a, such a different place was, I mean, it was sort of, a, it was a revelation. It was, um, you know, it was walkable. We could go walk to get our groceries and our, uh, to go to restaurants and the movie theater and all of this to like a 16 or 17 year old from the suburbs was just extraordinarily exciting. But more than that was um, the quality of the place. And obviously DC is maybe a bit exceptional in the way that the buildings help tell the story of the place. And in, in this case, the story of our country. Country. But you can, I think, draw a direct line from that experience and being in the quality of that place to where I've ended up at the National Trust working um, in support of preservation in, in many different ways. And, you know, ultimately, I really believe that preservation can um, improve quality of life for people in, in lots of different ways. Um, and that is what keeps me uh, committed to the work and makes me so excited to work in partnership with um, my uh, my co-CEOs here. That's all for that great introduction. I know I definitely learned a lot about everyone. Um, Patrice, I think you and I are close. I'm at 18 years at the National Trust. Um, but um, as we consider all the information you just shared with us, um, I was wondering if you can all talk about how, from your specific perspectives, you would put preservation into action and how do you build connections between each of the different organizations in the National Trust family of companies? That's a great question. I think um, just you've heard, I mean, just listening to Aaron and Patrice and David talk, you know, the impact of preservation is really clear, right? So I think every day the National Trust family puts preservation into action in all kinds of ways, right? Through Aaron described, you know, neighbor to neighbor and turning love into power and, and how important places are in that. And Patrice talked about, um, you know, recognizing the power of the built environment and now working to, um, to decarbonize the built environment and also preserve its historical particularity. And David does this incredible impact investing, which serves communities um, by, you know, using tax credits as a as an impact investment strategy for historic buildings and, and so you can sort of see the impact in in the work um it, just by listening to them talk about what motivates them i think and as i've been um, listening to people who've been in preservation for a long time talk about what they do i think sometimes within preservation it's easy to take for granted its impact because we see it all the time. I don't think it's as obvious to people who aren't familiar with preservation. Um, I don't think it's so obvious to them the power that these tools have to address challenges that we now face. So as an example, the Action Fund uh, at the National Trust is remaking the commemorative landscape to honor the achievements and the stories of all Americans so that the things that we activate and preserve actually tell our collective story and we can then better imagine a shared future. Um, and so, so that kind of impact, I think part of my job um, now as somebody who's coming in from the outside is to be able maybe to speak that impact in um, language that, that 
um, comes from outside of preservation, if that makes any sense. So to talk about it in language that, that people recognize as Aaron and David and Patrice have already demonstrated their ability to do, right? Talk about the power of preservation um, in climate, talk about the power of preservation in economic revitalization, the power of preservation in building community and um, uh, uh, re-energizing um, regional downtowns and rural areas. So, I mean, to me, it's, it's about how we talk about this impact so that everyone can recognize its power and its potential to address challenges that we face as a, as a country. I don't know if you guys, I mean, you guys are better able to, better equipped to talk about this, I think, but that, that's what I hear when I listen to my colleagues talk. I agree, Carol. I, I think when I talk to people in my network who are not in the preservation field, right, they, they I've come to realize that it, it's not that they don't care, they just don't know how to focus on preservation actionably, right? They talk about risk and return and 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 capital and you know they they look at things you know with the same discipline and focused on financial feasibility and long term sustainability, but when you actually look at the stories of the projects and the examples of the the type of things that NTCIC and 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 others uh, on, on this call the things that we get behind and you look at the very real impacts like jobs that are created and affordable housing units that are that are delivered and, and carbon offset and affordable renewable energy for low income and moderate communities, you can realize very quickly that preservation through affordable, um, through adaptive reuse is an opportunity to do well and do good at the same time. And I don't know anybody that, that doesn't like that. And so <laughs> I think, right? I mean, so I think one of the things that we can do, all of us can do, um, all of us on, on, on this panel are doing, and everybody on, on the, the webinar can, can do uh, to advance our, our shared cause is, is to be better storytellers and, and point out those examples of, of, of those things in our communities that are impactful and, and that we want to do more of. I think that's right. And Carol, I also just wanted to say that I think your framing of um, our work as being and making visible what's invisible behind the work is really important. I think one of the things that's becoming more and more obvious to me is that a, a lot of people understand kind of like in their guts what a main street is. It's a place that they've been or a place that they grew up or a place of their imagination and they, they can feel it. Um, but these strong and vibrant places, they don't just happen by accident. These aren't just naturally occurring, right? They take a lot of intention and they require community engagement and vision and responsive tra uh, strategies to a changing world and like ongoing nurturing. And all of this is the work that's done by Main Street organizations. And um, it's a flexible and important gap filler of governance structures at the local level. Um, and I think it's our job to be able to tell that story and make that invisible work more visible. I would only add to all of this, the wonderful comments that um, I, I think I, I see the trust work and the, the work of really all the subsidiaries as being um, crucial to helping remove the barriers to do the work that we want to do, um, because you know, in David's in David's case, if it's if it's tax credit advocacy, making sure that these tax credits are working as well as they possibly can, or in the case of the, you know, the loan fund, um, you know, providing debt capital to help finance adaptive reuse projects. That, that piece of um, really stepping in to kind of ratchet down the, the challenges people face in repurposing buildings is such a crucial role that I, I see all of us playing. Yeah, I think there's something about, so one of the things that I've been thinking about since I came to the National Trust is, you know, how to, how to express, the, the trust does a lot of things, right? If you take the, the National Trust family, we do a lot, there's a lot going on and there's a lot of different areas of work from, um, you know, 11, stepping in to protect vulnerable places, to um, preserving landmark buildings, to building community in regional downtowns and rural areas, to supporting 
you know, supporting adaptive reuse projects in all different kinds of contexts. So there's a lot happening here. And um, I think it's important that we have some way of describing a purpose that we can all get behind and that we can all share. And so I've been listening a lot to people talk about why preservation, why they're interested and in including folks on this call. And, um, and I think, you know, this at the highest level, I think, you know, what do we do? Well, I mean, it seems to me that the one way of saying it, this might not be right, but that, you know, in collaboration with the American people, we activate the power of place to serve the public good improve people's lives and enable a shared future, right? So, so to me, that, that, that very high level statement captures kind of what Aaron, what Main Street does, what Patrice does, what David does, what we all wanna to do together, what Brent Legs does at the Action Fund, what Jennifer Stanley does with um, 11 Most, what all of our, all of these programs, what we do with American Express and backing small historic restaurants, all of this work, our own sites, our historic sites where we wanna, exemplify what good site management looks like, I, I think can be, can be everyone, I want everyone to be able to see themselves in that one statement. And I want us to be able to make clear to people who don't consider themselves preservationists, why these tools are so important to address the challenges that we face now as a country. Carol, I think that's a great segue into what we were gonna ask about next, which is because we're about to reach our 75th anniversary, Carol already started articulating her um, her question that she's been asking around the country, which is, what is your why? And so what I was hoping the panelists would be willing to do is tell us a little bit more, more about um, about your why. What is that? Um, and, and how do you see that happening in your respective organizations? Yeah, I, I'm happy to start. And I think the I think the wonderful thing about this space is you don't need a single why. There are lots of reasons that you can come come to this field. And I think that's certainly true of myself. So um, to talk a little bit about specifically the work of the NT Green Fund. So one of the things we know is that um, reusing existing structures, right? Adaptive reuse is really important to our efforts to ratchet down carbon emissions in this country and to do it really quickly. And yet we know that we demolish about a billion square feet just of commercial space uh, a year. Um, there's maybe as many as 19 billion, I'm sorry, 19 million, not billion, million um, buildings that have abandoned, been abandoned in the country. There is such enormous opportunity to take existing space and repurpose it in a way that is carbon friendly to really support uh, positive community outcomes and honestly meet, you know, meet, um, meet the moment in terms of, you know, we can think about the housing crisis in this country and that we're short somewhere between four and seven million units of housing. And in so many cases, there's really a, a wonderful opportunity to take existing buildings and repurpose them um, into that housing. And so, um, you know, that uh, the climate piece of this is a big part of my of my why. Um, there's no question. But the the equity piece of this, the you know, making sure that we're supporting positive outcomes in partnership with communities, particularly disinvested communities where preservation may not always have had the best record of engaging and in supporting positive outcomes. That is um, certainly a guiding light in, in, my, in my work and um, you know, bringing those two things together, really trying to bring capital to the table to support adaptive reuse in a way that you know, improves energy performance of buildings uh, and particularly in disinvested places is, um, you know, that's, that's my North Star in the morning. And I'll just mention that David's my new best friend since he has a lot of experience <laughs> having raised the capital that we will need to deploy in this uh, this new fund. Sounds like a handoff to me. Um, well, my, my, my why is really a, a combination of many of the things that Patrice just talked about. But I'll start with um, one thing that's really I'm, one thing I'm passionate about is is bringing people together in common purpose. And so. There are, there are a number of people on this call and a number of organizations, and I've spent a lot of time as I joined, um, since I joined in February this year, uh, asking a lot of questions like Carol did and trying to connect dots and trying to make sure that um, we are taking advantage of the opportunities that are right in front of us. And so 
there are a lot of opportunities to um, promote, you know, better climate solutions, but I'm really focused on community development. And that means to me, building a better future and creating equal opportunity for people in disinvested communities. And, you know, this work that we do, um, the way I like to think about it is capital is lazy. Money's lazy. It doesn't naturally flow into um, hard areas, right? It only goes there if we make it go there. And so this is really hard work. And sometimes the results of our work, we don't see that for years. And I, I, but I can tell you that it is super gratifying when you see the catalytic or the knock-on effects of an investment that's made uh, and, and, and you get to hear the stories of the people whose lives were literally changed for the better because we had the courage to make an investment in, in a community that needed it desperately. So those stories of impact, those real stories that, that change the lives of people, they move me and they inspire me to continue to do this work every day. That's my why. I love that, David. Um, I think um, I was just laughing, thinking about Patrice's uh, childhood, how she grew up um, talking about the suburbs, because I think I spent some, some of my most formative years in the parking lot of a 7-Eleven, which brings me really clearly to my why, which is that I believe that all communities deserve a culturally distinct place of belonging and economic vitality. And I think Main Street America allows people to hold on to the things that are the most special and precious and reinvigorate them with economic vitality and people and community and all of the things that you want to have in, in the places where we live. And Carol, I've told you different stories about how Main Streeters do that through the entire district, the entire place, but through specific buildings. Um, and we see this time and time again all across the country. Yes. So, I, I mean, I'm so grateful to have the opportunity to work with um, my colleagues on this call and, and with everybody here. And I think, so I think one thing that, um, that I would say, again, coming from outside the field is that not, there are a lot of people out there who don't have this view of preservation, who don't think of preservation necessarily as being about, um, you know, inspire, you know, pushing lazy capital to where it needs to go or um, helping reduce the carbon emissions or revitalizing regional downtowns by ensuring that all communities can um, energize the places that they love. This is not necessarily the view that everyone has of preservation. And so I think it's important for, for all of us to um, to reach out and to try to engage people who don't necessarily come out of this very powerful and important movement. And sometimes that means shifting a little bit on how we think. So it's interesting, like Patrice and David, and I mean, all Aaron and Patrice and David are all in some sense talking about adaptive reuse, right? How do you, I mean, this isn't all that any of them does, but, but that adaptive reuse is a really significant part of preservation tactics. Um, and, and it's important for us as you know, I grew up in a really old town. So, you know, surrounded in some cases by pretty strict preservationists. So it's important for us to realize that the alternative to adaptive reuse isn't better preservation, it's demolition, <laughs> right? So, so we always have to think about, you know, the world that we're operating in. And I think it, that's just an important thing to, for us to think about, especially given um, the, the kind of challenges and opportunities that we face. Preservation can be hugely helpful in addressing the affordable housing crisis, right? We gotta be open to adaptive reuse. So I, I, think, it's, I think it's things like that, that um, where I think an outside perspective might, might be helpful. Preservation can really help with so many areas. Um, if, if we're flexible and creative about how we think about the legacy that we're honoring here as preservationists. Great. Um, just a reminder, I'm seeing some people raising their hands. Just uh, remember to ask your question using the Q&A in the panel. We're not unmuting anyone to ask questions verbally. Uh, so just make sure you put them in the Q&A function. Um, so 
Carol, for to that extent, Carol, Patrice, David, and Aaron, all of you, um, uh, what what are the possibilities for the future of preservation? What is, what is I know this is a, a tall order, but uh, what is your vision for the future? Um, what do you see as the Im potential impact of preservation? So, I mean, I, I think you've, I, I mean, I think from, from everybody that we've, we've heard about the powerful impact that preservation tools are having now, um, the, there's an area where, I mean, I'll defer to my colleagues to talk more about um, the power, the power of preservation in different in different in their air in different areas of work of the national trust because this is a partnership we're all partners here in this work um i will talk about one area which i think um which i think is particularly important now and an opportunity so we're a pretty um fractured country where we're really polarized and um there's a lot of disaffection from the institutions that we've inherited and and i think that the i think that through the power of place, through activating places that matter in communities all over the country, that we can actually re-inspire a kind of civic engagement. And I don't say this in some sort of Pollyanna-ish way. I say it because in my short time at the National Trust, I've seen how meaningful sites bring people together across all other lines that divide them. I've seen communities um, rally around a tiny church liberals, conservatives, people of all races and religions rally around to try to protect and activate a particular site that matters to their community. I think we see this in main streets across the country. And I think we see it in um, movements to protect what matters in a particular community. So I believe that the power of place can actually help us reimagine ourselves and our civic identities as Americans and can help cultivate in all of us a sense of belonging, which is difficult in a big pluralistic country. So I'm really excited about the power of place to address that urgent challenge that we face as a country. People can come together in these places that matter to them um, and through the mediation of that experience, begin to rebuild our sense of community and connection and, and shared purpose so that we can work together towards a shared future. But I, I'll let um, Erin and Erin can talk about, you know, her, her, um, the power of how preservation is so important to communities and she serves. Well, I mean, I think you're spot on with this, Caroline. I, I would almost say that there's like a uh, almost like a feedback loop, right? You're, you're saying, I think that preservation will inspire a new wave of civic life and civic participation. And I think civic participation is sort of like a requirement for main street organizations, right? Like the main street organizations, I think thrive best when there is this sort of like continuous feedback loop with the with the neighborhood and the communities around the district that is constantly reimagining the district for the future. Um, right. And I think the the beauty of having preservation at the heart of all of that, Carol, you've talked about this so much in your first year here is like bringing the past into the present so that we're able to hold both of those at the same time. And I think Main Street's like requirement so that these towns and communities can keep a balanced budget is also to keep that eye towards the future and making sure that everybody's input is going into making the places thrive today and tomorrow. Yeah, I think, I think that's, I mean, how we, um, how we use the power of place to re-engage with one another and to cultivate a sense of belonging in, in everyone so that we can move forward in light of where we've been, I think is just so important. And it is the work of preservation. And I don't think it happens without preservationists at the table. I, I think what both of you have offered is um, beautiful and impossible to top. And so what I'm gonna do is um, maybe go, go into a slightly more tactical place which is if I think um, in, very much in service of the, the outcomes that you've just described, you know, if I think about vision for the future, um, you know, Aaron, you were just talking about how 
main streets are constantly in the process of reimagining, right? Reimagining the future, right? You're getting new inputs. You have to react to them. And I, I think that um, any vision for preservation it has to do the same in the future, right? Which is to say that we have, um, you know, we have, I, I think, policies and practices that have served us extraordinarily well, but could serve us better in the future. And also there, there's, you know, a need and an opportunity for some of those, um, those approaches to evolve over time. And, uh, and I think, you know, ultimately, Carol, it goes back to what you were saying is it's not a choice between, you know, more perfect preservation, um, that it's it's really uh, potentially we're looking at more building demolitions if we don't think in new and creative and re-energized ways about how to really uh, meet people where they are and uh, make the work of preservation just a little bit easier. I'm excited also by the way, you know, Carol, you use the word reimagine, right? And I think that the four of us on this call together have spent time reimagining the ways that we can collaborate and support and elevate our work together um, in a way that has never been done before. And, and that's possible because of the fact that we're all new leaders, right? And I talked about connecting dots, um, doing simple things tactically, Patrice, you know, like, um, making sure that the project sponsors that we work with are fully aware of the specialty insurance products that National Trust Insurance Services offers, right? And, you know, the work that we're doing to help stand up the National Green Fund and connect that, in, in, get, get, getting that impactful capital into the hands, along with valuable technical assistance to project sponsors in Main Street communities across the country. Um, and, and, you know, it, you can't say that without acknowledging the fact that you know, there's a climate initiative as part of that. That's a that's a, a major part of that capital. And we have to spread awareness of the investment opportunities. Um, and, and we have a, an empty solar business as well that and helping people understand that that that's a proactive way to ensure that historic preservation efforts will even be possible in the future. Right. If you believe, as I do, that reducing greenhouse gas emissions will lead to a healthier planet. And dollars invested uh, in this way reduce the likelihood that places that matter will be destroyed by flood and fire. And so, um, but but ultimately, I, I come back to what Carol said, and you know, it's it's those these places that matter that provide a forum where people can have civil uh, discourse, right, and where we can meet people where they are, where they can be listened to. We, we, People, a lot of people in this today do a lot of talking but, and not enough listening, right? And, um, you know, I just think that the more we can be more others focused um, and these places, these places that matter provide a nice place for us to, to do that. And so I'll stop there. Yeah, I mean, I think that's like, imagine, um, it, you know, imagine, you know, just to, to cite one example, you know, we're about to commemorate in this country over probably a, a more than 10 year period, the a com commemoration of the, of the founding of the United States. And imagine, and you know, we understand the values that um, come out of that era as an unfinished promise, right? Imagine people at sites related to I, one idea, freedom of religion, free exercise of religion, all across the country, understanding how that idea played out in a very particular place and the ways in which that kind of connection to that place and that history can animate conversations across difference in a powerful way and help us to see possibilities that before those conversations didn't, weren't visible at all, right? So conversations aren't debates and you want a winner and a loser. Conversations are actually modes of inquiry that open up possibilities that are simply not visible prior to the conversation happening. That's democratic deliberation at its best. And site-inspired democratic deliberation can really rebuild that sense of shared purpose that, that we need to be a thriving democratic republic. And I believe in that really strongly. And I believe that preservation has a way, has a path to helping us, helping us get to that place. All amazing. <laughs> um, you, as you can see, we've got a very vibrant chat. 
going on here. Um, and what I wanted to turn to now, because we're at 2.40 and I wanted to make sure we had time to get into the questions, um, the audience questions. So we had a number of pre-submitted ones. Um, and I think based on where this conversation landed, the first one I'm going to ask is about small, um, how can we work collabor collaboratively to better connect with smaller or more rural communities across the country? And Patrice, we've actually had a number of people ask for more information about the work you are doing. And I, if I can just punt to you to start. Sure, yeah, um, great. Well, thanks for the interest in the Green Fund. Um, we are in the quiet phase of the launch, which is why if you Google NT Green Fund uh, right now, I'm, I'm not actually sure that anything would show up. Um, so we are going to be, we are going to be uh, launching this more publicly in the new year. Um, I'm happy, I, I don't know if we're sharing email addresses, but I have some information that I would be happy to share or Priya could send it out um, that will tell you a little bit more about the work of the fund. Just to say very broadly, this is a new fund that is dedicated to supporting decarbonizing adaptive reuse projects. And we're focused um, especially on uh, a couple of things. One is supporting investment in disinvested communities. That can be rural communities, communities of color, places where capital typically does not go. Um, the second thing is we, we acknowledge a real need to support um, small scale projects, small scale preservation projects. Uh, under $5 million in total project costs, sometimes well below that. And so um, other than mentioning, we're doing this in partnership with uh, David Clower and his team at the National at NTCIC. Um, I'll, I'll just say more, more to follow, um, more to come. Uh, Priya, and then you had asked a very good question about the way that we engage in rural areas. And I can just um, start that out by talking about the Green Fund's commitment to supporting um, particularly disinvested rural communities. Um, you know, David mentioned capital is lazy. And uh, I think what we've seen in sort of the modern way that real estate is financed is uh, there is not a lot of interest typically in smaller places and in smaller projects. And that is a, uh, that is a gap that we are specifically looking to fill. And it comes directly out of my personal experience uh, with Main Street America. Main Street America serves, um, a, uh, you know, the majority of its network is in rural communities. Uh, and again, we just see these unmet needs in terms of wonderful adaptive reuse projects that are starved of capital. And we endeavor to step in and, and be, um, be of support there. So Erin, maybe I can hand it to you to talk more about Main Street's work. I would be happy to, but first I want to talk about you and how wonderful it's been to work um, alongside you with your visionary leadership and just echo what David said earlier about what a joy it is to work um, in collaboration with you, Patrice and David and Carol together. I feel like this is a really collaborative team. Um, and I, I feel like we have had the opportunity to make sure that the NT Green Fund can launch, but I think like Carol has fostered um, an atmosphere of collaboration and trust among us that I think feels really special and important at this at this moment. So um, I just wanted to thank you for that, Patrice. You've led something that's come from the wisdom that you gained in the Main Street's work and and woven it together well with NTCIC and the trust um, best assets. Um, but I I do I I want to talk a little bit about. This question, just because I'm kind of curious where it came from, I know that there's a lot of Main Streeters on this webinar today, so I'm curious if it came from somebody from a rural community who's asking us to do better, or maybe it's coming from somebody who isn't as familiar with Main Street's work and what we're already doing in rural places. So I guess I'll just say first, I think there is an opportunity for us to always do better. Um, I know that the Main Street approach is flexible and it's adaptable and it works in a lot of contexts, but if there is something that you think we can be doing better in rural and, and small communities, I'd love to hear it. Um, but I also just wanted to share with anybody who might not be as familiar with Main Street America, um, Patrice mentioned the majority of our work serves rural communities. One of our core values is to support small for greater impact. And um, 
60% of Main Street communities identify as being rural, but I think it's important to just be super clear about what we're talking about here because those definitions can be a little bit blurry. I think oftentimes when we're talking from the federal perspective, we're talking about communities under uh, with a population of less than 50,000, but in the Main Street network, that could actually feel like a really, really high, large population. In the Main Street network, um, a fourth of all of the places that we serve are towns with a population of less than 5,000 people and almost half have less than 10,000 and nearly 70% have populations of less than 25,000. Um, so a lot of the communities that we work in are really small and remote from other places. Um, I have an amazing board of directors, um, by the way, and if you don't know the folks on the Main Street America board, you should get to know them. And I'll say that I've learned a lot from Michael Wagler, who serves on our board and is the Main Street Iowa coordinator. Um, and he shared a lot with me about the way that preservation looks and feels in rural places, especially ones that are from an agricultural society and the way that the culture of stewardship informs and influences preservation at the local level. Um, and it, I think one of the things that I've seen um, from him in uh, like out in places, I, I know I saw a couple people from Ames on the on the webinar. I didn't know if I saw anybody from Nevada, but I think one thing that I think is really interesting about the way that Nevada is approaching historic preservation is to do things small and incrementally. Um, so rather than focusing on restoring like one big iconic building, they've done small incremental practical preservation projects that help build momentum and energize the community around continuing that effort. Um, that spirit I think is great for having historic preservation, like catch fire in the imagination of other people around them. And it also helps drive economic vitality. I think I, I would just add that uh, there are many programs that, um, at the trust that that also work in rural communities, um, I, there there's a number of small restaurants. So backing small historic restaurants is one that ten, it's it's a nomination program. So communities nominate a place. It can be a coffee shop. It can be a diner. That's that's a, a central to building community in that neighborhood, and that's a, through a partnership with American Express. And that program oftentimes does support rural communities or smaller neighborhoods. The African-American Cultural Heritage Action Fund does a lot of work in rural communities. Preserving Black Churches does a lot of work in rural communities. So while the while it's not clear maybe from the name of the program that these are programs that are supporting uh, preservation projects in, in smaller communities and rural communities and communities of color, in fact, that's what's happening. Um, and I think, I think over the years, the 11 most endangered list has also made um, a concerted effort to identify important preservation projects in communities that might not otherwise get the attention that they really deserve. Um, so we, I agree, like we could certainly do a better job of, of um, highlighting important projects in those areas. It is a commitment that I think we all share. Can I just add that, um, you know, tactically, um, I think, Obviously, technology can be incredibly helpful in connecting to rural communities. It's obviously made today's event possible, um, but we're also going to have the opportunity to lean into the fact that we now have a more geographically distributed workforce. You know, I, I live in Scottsdale, Arizona, and lead an organization that's based in Washington D.C. And you know, we have team members all over the country, and that can really be a positive thing. And you know, ours is a very local business. And so uh, we're trying to continue to identify and hire top talent in, in, in parts of the country uh, strategically that give us um, what I call a handshake connectivity with the communities that we serve. And so we want to be within driving distance of people and, and that, that take the capital that we, that we deploy. Um, and maybe one other example of, of an initiative trust is involved in that is working in rural communities is the preserve route 66 campaign which which i love um and which is a go the, the goal is of that initiative is to collect 2026 uh, stories and photos um of, of the route 66 by its centennial in 2026 and provide grants and support to important places along the historic highway and and to um 
advocate for its designation as a national historic trail, which would bring more awareness and, and, and resources to, to this iconic roadway. So I, I think that's just an incredible story uh, and, and, and stories and stories and stories that, that they, we have an opportunity and we're trying to tell. So kudos to the trust for doing that. Great, um, it's uh, 2.51. So I'm gonna try and get one additional pre-submitted question at, before we go to the closing one. Um, how is, how are, okay, one of the questions that I also see coming up in the Q&A is about engaging communities at the local level. Uh, there's a question about commissions, there's a question about smaller preservation groups. And I was wondering if you had any advice or suggestion around that. So again, you know, like I'm still learning so much about the preservation, like the preservation network that exists. And I think one of the questions um, that I would have is, you know, how can we be um, helpful and supportive of local preservation organizations? And, um, and also what can uh, the National Trust do more, do more easily because we are a national organization or because we're headquartered in Washington or what is it possible for us to do that would be helpful that is harder for other organizations to do? Um, and I think, so, so that, that's one question that I have. You know, it's interesting over this, I think the preservation network has grown up as the National Trust has emerged. So over the past 75 years, it's not only that the National Trust is 75 years old, it's also that there's a much more robust network of preservation organizations across the country that focus on local preservation projects and have a lot of expertise when it comes to um, local issues and local preservation concerns. So I have been thinking, you know, just in all candor as, as I come into this role about what's the distinctive function of a national organization? What can we do? How do we best serve the cause of preservation as a national organization? And I'm not sure that we've totally, I mean, obviously this is me talking to lots and lots of people trying to understand this um, to figure that out. I think one thing that we, that, that is helpful for us to try to do is to, is to ask, what's the role of preservation tools and approaches now and over the next decade? It's changed over time. So what does a country need from us now as a movement? What does a country need from us now as a national organization? At the same time, we wanna build the strength of our partners locally um, and, and try to provide assistance that we are best equipped to provide, whether that's policy assistance or legal advocacy assistance or guidance in that way. But I think this is a very important question and I certainly don't know the answer. Um, so I, I, I hope people who have thoughts about how we can be helpful would write to me, um, you know, email me so that I can learn from your thoughts and ideas. Okay. Uh, so I'll put one more in here before. Um, how is the, um, I mean, Sorry, I'm trying to combine questions on the fly here. Um, <laughs> okay, broadly, how is the National Trust promoting equity and inclusivity in its preservation efforts? And this is, again, a combination of different questions we've had about everything from uh, preserving public lands with indigenous history to uh, telling the story of Latin communities or Asian American communities. So this is sort of me trying to amalgamate them all together. I'll say that, you know, a lot of the projects, many of the projects that we fund are oftentimes located in, in communities that are, that are racially uh, divided. Um, one project that comes to mind um, is, is located in Pontiac, Michigan, uh, which is a suburb about 20 miles, 25 miles northwest of Detroit. So, 53,000 square foot school building built in 1922 approximately. Uh, it's just being transformed into a community facility that's providing all kinds of social services, everything from a Head Start, Head Start facility, after school and summer programs, adult education, a federally qualified health healthcare center, commercial kitchen incubator, um, fresh produce co-op grocery store, um, and other things. But, but what it is, it's an amazing example of adaptive reuse and taking a vacant building and repurposing it to fit the expressed needs of this racially 
diverse community and, and, and giving the community what it says it needs. And so, um, you know, going, not, not being prescriptive until, you know, you know, funding things that we think from Washington DC, people in Pontiac, Michigan need, we'll try to listen to the community and, and help fund solutions that, that fit the community's expressed needs. I hope that answers your question. Yeah. I think so what David was saying, I think that I mean, I've heard that from Aaron and Patrice that the and and from Brent Legs and Jennifer Sandy and, and people that run programs at the trust is that you listen to the community first. This is a collaborative effort and we what we we take our cues from the communities with whom we work. And and I think that is step one. Um I think the there's programs at the National Trust that are doing a lot to remake the commemorative landscape of the country so that the experiences and achievements of all people are acknowledged. So you see this in particular in our work with Robert Small's house, with the Nina Simone house, with Langston Hughes house, um, our work in Chinatowns, our work in highlighting um, sustainable Tokyo. So there's, and our work, um, our, our work with um, some really important um, indigenous sites in, in particularly Sitka, we did on the 11 most list last year. And there sometimes what preservation means is a little bit different, right? Sometimes what's being preserved are cultural practices that were enabled by a particular built environment, but that are also a little bit independent of the very specific built environment, right? So sometimes it's a question of how do you, how do you um, uh, protect and, and, and invigorate cultural practices that matter right? Um, even when the physical environment changes. And what, what does that mean? Sometimes it means rebuilding structures as opposed to preserving structures. Sometimes it means creating a new sp a space, uh, creating a space for cultural practices in a place other than where it was historically. So it's a complicated set of um, uh, practices that are that take preservation beyond specifically preserving a structure, if that makes any sense. Right. I don't think I'm being very clear, but I think that's that's also an important part of um, of honoring the preservation imagination and goals of lots of different kinds of communities. Thanks, Carol. So I think uh, we're at 258. So I'm going to ask this last sort of rapid fire question. Um, <laughs> one of the ones that came in was asking each of you to say what your top four actions are for individuals who are at this webinar to do today. And I actually think I saw that in the chat from someone else. So if you don't mind going around and I guess we can start, um, I'm gonna start with David, is that okay? <laughs> um, and, we'll, and we'll go from there. So I'll tell you that um, we're celebrating our 25th anniversary this year at NTCIC. We've invested two and a half billion dollars of tax credit equity since inception, uh, but we're on a new growth trajectory. And this year we pro project that will invest $325 million for our clients in, in community development, tax credit investments alone just this year. So we're actively looking for new corporate investors. And so if you have connections to organizations that you think would be interested in our work, I'd love to speak to them. So please connect them to me. So I can I can go next, and um, I think it's possible in the in the coming Congress that we may have some significant advocacy opportunities, irrespective of who is in the White House. And so I would urge you to um, get in touch and get uh, get yourself on the National Trust Advocacy Alerts if you're not already getting those. Um, I can't emphasize enough. We saw this in Main Street. I can't emphasize enough how important you are to any sort of the success of any sort of advocacy effort, whether it's tax credit or related to anything else. So yeah, I'll, I'll my... just, yeah, I'll just jump in there and say that uh, it's the Action Center. So if you go to our website, savingplaces.org, search for Action Center, which they just dropped the link in, you'll see a place to sign up for email. And Aaron, if you have one on the Main Street side, um, we can try and get that in the follow-up email as well. Sure. Yeah, I've got a, a quick action for everybody. I'm sure everybody's already involved in their local Main Street organization. So beyond that, I'd say, um, you know, while everybody's thinking about the damage of uh, Hurricane Helene on communities, I think you can take a look at the new Main Street Disaster and Resilience Toolkit that we just released and share that with 
small businesses that you know and communities in your network that are are looking for ways to do short, medium, and long-term recovery. Toolkit's amazing. And Carol, last words. <laughs> well, I would say help us to talk about the impact for good that preservation has in a whole range of areas um, so that more people like you will join us and ensure that preservationists are at the table when we're thinking about decisions related to climate and affordable housing and equity, because we will make better decisions. If that's the case, there will be better decisions for everyone. So my plea is let's talk about the impact that preservation has so that more people can see the power of preservation and the power of place in their own lives and, and with respect to the issues they care about. Awesome. So before we close out, um, thank you so much, David, Carol, Patrice, and Aaron for this conversation. We have a couple more things we wanted to ask of you. Uh, Rhonda, if you don't mind throwing the slides up. Um, so. First of all, uh, as many of you might know, we're gonna be in New Orleans in just a few short weeks, uh, October 28th through 30th, 2024. Um, it's not too late to register. Uh, the link is on the screen, savingplaces.org slash conference. And then finally, uh, we really hope that you've enjoyed learning more about how together we are improving lives through preservation. If you have not yet, please consider making a donation to the National Trust and join us in this crucial work of historic preservation as we build on the past to enable a shared and humane future via the URL savingplaces.org slash support. And then also if you have a donor advised fund, DAF Day is October 10th. Uh, so we also have a special plays, uh, page for that. Um, thank you so much for being supporters and for being here at this webinar today. And thank you to the panelists for sharing their knowledge, their ex expertise and their leadership with us. Um, if you have any additional questions for anyone on the panel, for me, for anyone, uh, email forum at savingplaces.org and we'll just make sure that gets to the right person. As a reminder, we've recorded this webinar and we will be sharing it with you about 24 hours from now via the email you signed up for. Thank you so much, everyone. <laughs>